All right, welcome everybody. Congratulations on surviving yet another AGU. Um, it is Friday afternoon at 4 p.m. We're so excited that you're here with us in our session. Uh, this is probably going to be one of the funnest sessions you've been to at these conferences. We're going to focus on the why we do science. And uh, when we publish papers, it's probably the most sterile version we could do to communicate what we do to people who are not scientists. And so the why is how we unite with our audience. And also, speaking of audience, want to uh, say hello to all of us who are watching us on AGU Go. So, well, good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. And um, we all have this capability of connecting with the audience when we share our emotions, when we communicate science, focusing on the why. We all have this superpower of science communication. So I urge all of you, when you talk to the public, don't, don't be shy about uh, showing your cape. Um, so we have a very cool session today, and on behalf of my co-conveners, uh, Heidi Stelzer, Claudia Corona, and Tashiana Osborne, we're really excited that, that you're here with us today. So hi everyone, I'm Tashiana, and all of us co-conveners, we are part of the AGU Voices for Science um, Advocates. And this is a new program by AGU where they selected 30 of us from across the nation. We're all in kind of different subfields, different backgrounds, but we all come together to work on um, training in science communication and outreach and policy. So if you're interested in checking that out, it's going to be going on again this year. It's the AGU Voices for Science Advocates. So thanks for being here. We're going to get started with our speakers here. Hi, good afternoon. So I'm Sriparna Shaha, and I will be talking about why we do lab experiments and what, that, what they can tell us about the inner secrets of the continents. And before I start, I want to show you this um, comic illustration art that I did because I was struggling that how do I present the exact nuance of what, why I run experiments. So I will walk you through. Um, so <laughs> our planet Earth is unique because it is the only planet that has continents. And do we have a... Okay, so it's the only planet which has continents. But uh, so in order to understand that how Earth has evolved over time, it's important to understand the features of these continents. But if you take a look at the inner structure of the continents, we, sh we see that it's um, very heterogeneous, which means that the, there is a difference in the properties and uh, composition of the inner layers. And it's the difference in these properties. Uh, if you look here, um, we see that it drives processes like uh, the, there are differences in density and other physical parameters which um, cause it to convect. And by and convection, I use a technical term here, but um, it, is, it is one of the processes which is driving plate tectonics. And plate tectonics, what we see is in the form of mountains, volcanoes, and earthquakes. The continents are very unique specifically in this context because if we take a look at the inner um, core of the continents, they are devoid of any kind of tectonic activity. And given that Earth is tectonically active, it's very um, confusing, it's peculiar that what causes this stability of, con of the cratons. So here I have done an illustration where I show the inner, uh, the, the structure of the craton. And we see that um, the cratons are as old as four billion years. They are very old in their age. And also, um, <coughs> study of earthquake waves that travel through these cratons show us that these are very fast. And the speed with which, which these waves travel across the, through the layers of the Earth actually depends on the physical properties of each layer. So given that we, we kind of have a sense of, OK, the cratons are very fast, we take a look at how this velocity of uh, the earthquake waves as they travel through the Earth uh, varies with depth. And we see that there's a peculiar feature. Uh, there's a sudden reduction at a depth which is like in the middle of what the total lithospheric depth is. And by lithosphere, I mean it's like the top layer, the rigid layer of the Earth. So we take a look at um, natural samples, uh, which are called xenoliths. 
And these rocks tell us that the Earth is composed of, like the uh, cratons are composed of a specific type of rock which is called as peridotite. And so even though we, what we can do is in the lab, we can cook up these rocks to understand how exactly the processes which are operative in the, in the interior of the Earth, which otherwise are inaccessible, can enable us to understand these properties of the cratons. So what I do in my lab is I take a blob of peridotite and I cook it. I provide it with heat, pressure, and time. And I study what minerals form as a result of that interaction over time. And it helps us to understand how or what processes operating within the interior of the Earth, which are otherwise inaccessible regions, can enable us to explain these properties or this velocity structure that, that we are interested in. So lab experiments, in fact, are a very unique way of combining what um, features we observe um, through the collection of seismic data and at the same time simulate processes that can explain um, the processes that are going on in regions which we otherwise cannot reach. So thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take those. Thank you. Crockpot science. Awesome. So th those of you who are speaking, you have five minutes. And uh, when that's up, Heidi will be walking towards you very seriously, and she might hug you off stage. So be careful. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Wendy Bohan, and I'm going to take a slightly different approach that's a little bit uncomfortable for me. I'm going to tell a story with no slides, and I'm going to talk about myself and not entirely my science. Here we go. So I grew up on a farm in rural Virginia. I was an actress. That was how I identified myself in high school. You have a strong identity. And I got a theater scholarship to go to college. I took a geology class while I was there. It rocked. I became a geology major in addition to theater. Graduated, didn't want to get a real job, so I had the opportunity to go to Los Angeles and do some film work. So, yeah, did that, and actually kind of managed to make it work. So I was a professional actress until the Hector Mine earthquake. So the Hector Mine earthquake was a magnitude 7.1 that happened in the desert outside of Los Angeles, but it was widely felt throughout Southern California, including in our little apartment in West Hollywood, which shook like crazy. Our little Netherlands dwarf bunny hopped in the toilet and was screaming. I don't know if you've ever heard a rabbit scream. You don't want to. Car alarms are going off. It was terrifying. To be honest, it was, it was a viscerally terrifying. The earth moved, and that was supposed to be a solid thing. And I had a geology background. I knew to expect aftershocks, and I was still afraid. So the next day, I went to the USGS Earthquake Hazards Program at Caltech, and I said, I want to volunteer here. And they said, no, thank you because large metropolitan earthquake, they're a touch busy, yeah. So I went back about a week later, which I never do, and said, please let me send faxes or something. I just totally dated myself. <laughs> but they said, okay, fine. And a few weeks later, the scientist in charge, Lucy Jones, said, you know, you actually are pretty good at this, and you actually know some stuff, so you want to work for us? So I quit my restaurant job, and I started working at the USGS. Two years later, I was the... Um, the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Southern California Earthquake Hazards Program. So I talked to people all over the country, all over Southern California, about earthquakes, what they could do to prepare for earthquakes. I want to share one person in particular that was the reason I chose to stay in that field. She called. She was from 29 Palms. She was a new mother who had military spouse. Her husband had deployed. So she had three small children, and there was a series of earthquakes in the desert that she had felt. Terrified. She's crying. She doesn't know how to protect her children. She doesn't know what to expect. And she's all alone, doesn't have any support system. So I was able to empathize with that and really connect with her and understand how terrifying that can be. And I gave her some resources that helped her to have a little bit of agency and make decisions that she felt could protect her family. And that's when I was like, this is it. This is how I can make a difference in the world. So I went back to graduate school because I realized that I couldn't communicate the science if I hadn't done the science. So I got a PhD in earthquake hazards, and then I also worked on geologic uh, communication and education. And instead of choosing the research track, which I love research, and it is vitally important, I chose to take my science and do science communication because that's how I feel like I can make an impact. And I know that the science that we do at AGU and across the world is critical. But finding a way to put that science into action 
is really what's going to make a difference in people's lives. We have to meet people where they are. We have to meet them with empathy. We have to understand and recognize we're bringing our own expertise, but these people have expertise too. Working with policymakers, working with citizens, working within communities, that's how we're going to be able to take the science, make it actionable, and actually make a difference and change people's lives. So that's why I do my science, and I would like to take this platform I have been given. Thank you to the moderators. If you are a scientist and you want to do research or you're not sure that the academic track is for you, you want to do something else, that's okay. You're not a leak. You're not a failure. You can take your science and apply it in other places and have an impactful, meaningful, happy, successful career. Thank you. Thank you so much for those words. I can't emphasize that enough. There's no need to pigeonhole oneself in science. Um, up next is Pam, I think. Can I speak from here? Yeah, yes, sure. Like. Good, too much hopping. <laughs> uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this. And thank you for reminding me of my very first earthquake. I thought it was <laughs> the dogs fighting until I realized they were asleep. <laughs> All right, so why I explore is not so complicated. It's really fun. But I wanted to put me in the context of other humans and also of all other organisms because it is my contention that all organisms must explore because it's a biological imperative. I think that we can all agree that it's important to explore, to understand, and to discover opportunities and threats and certainly, that's how I portray it when I have given talks. Most of my exploration has not been in the laboratory, although I started out that way, squeezing things in a diamond anvil cell to see what they would do. But most of my exploration has been in extreme environments on the Earth in pursuit of an understanding of how life does it when it's stressed so that I could better understand what life might look like, how it might do its business of metabolism on another planet. And so for the last several years, I've been exploring Mars with the Opportunity Rover in an attempt to understand what makes a habitable planet. Is Mars a habitable planet? And what can Mars tell us about <coughs> the Earth in that regard? Because if you're here, you probably know that our earliest history is gone subducted into oblivion. So to understand the earliest moments when life emerged is very tough. We don't have that direct evidence. So if life explores to look for new opportunities and to learn how to avoid threats, then it can't help it. But the question is, what is the larger utility in that that goes beyond that organism? So the punchline for that, in my opinion, is that it's an evolutionary forcing function. Organisms must learn to interact with other organisms. They must learn to interact with new environmental conditions because over time environments change, they become depleted of resources or they become filled with toxins or the waste products of the life that's presently there. And as that time passes, the organisms either adapt or they die, or they radiate to a new niche. So the question of where we will radiate to after we have filled every last piece of habitable real estate on the Earth can possibly be answered by looking at the other planets. If we explore the other planets then, there is the possibility that we will adapt to those environments by that very act of exploration. So as we begin to explore the possibility of moving to Mars for first exploration purposes, but perhaps later on colonization purposes, we have to look at the very real and I think a little bit exciting possibility that that exploration will change us genetically, psychically, socially, in all regards. So if exploration turns out to be an evolu evolutionary forcing function, then we have to allow ourselves to ask, how can we explore intentionally in ways that protect the environment we're exploring? 
we have inherited a colonialist ex uh, approach to exploration, <coughs> one in which we go to exploit. Exploration does not have to equal exploitation. There can be a better way of understanding new environments in advance of spoiling them so that we can take inventory and take a lesson from the life that is there or the lack of life that is there. So as we explore other planets, as we explore the most extreme parts of this planet, we can be mindful now that we have outgrown the need to explore in a colonialist fashion, embracing new perspectives when we go to look at another environment. And the last thing I want to say is that I completely agree. You can be anything with your science background. While I'm still a scientist and I'll still be working on Mars for a lot of years, uh, I actually have left my full-time job as a scientist two years ago and now I'm an Episcopal priest. So don't be afraid to talk to those people in the churches <laughs> as a scientist. <coughs> They'll listen. true interdisciplinary scientist you are. <laughs> Raphael, are you here? <coughs> there you are. Stop waving and come here. <laughs> no, I don't have slides. No. <coughs> I'm just gonna this All right. Um, hello, uh, thank you for being here. And before I begin, I'd like to thank Heidi, Claudia, Tashiana, and Samjoy to giving us this platform to talk a little bit about what we do uh, and why we do it. I think that we're more used to talking about uh, our science and not the whys. So having this platform is an amazing opportunity for us to do that. Um, as you will see, I don't have slides uh, because I was motivated by one presentation of one of our uh, fellow uh, Voices for Science member uh, yesterday. She said that she uh, wasn't using slides because she took a storytelling course and taught her how to communicate her science and her story without using graphs and photographs and whatever. And, but I have never taken a storytelling course, but I've been uh, dungeon mastering Dungeons and Dragons for 10 years. So I have a pretty good clue on how storytelling goes. Uh, so I think I can do this without any slides. But at the end, uh, there's not going to be any dragon slaying. It's not going to be any magical items. It's not going to be any horde. But I think that we all can get a little bit of experience points by learning from everything that people are saying here. Um, it's uh, just trying to think about this talk and trying to see the most effective way of telling you guys why I started to do what I do. Uh, I started to kind of backtrack my own story and evaluate all the pathways that I have taken and the, path, the paths that I still want to take. And backtracking and everything, I think that service is the word that I better want to define my science or for people to define the science that I do. Uh, when I'm gone or some sort of legacy that I want to, to, to leave behind. I think that science should be about service. I think that the science that we do should serve others, especially the science that I do. Uh, what I do is basically collect climate data and soil data to create models for crops and agriculture. And the days that we're living are pretty dark days. And the people that I deal with are people who are losing their homes, losing their lives, losing their history through climate change. People who were used to plant the same crops for ages in one location, now nothing is coming towards their end. <coughs> they have no income, and they don't have any money to invest in extremely fencing mechanisms or data, data collection for them to be able to see what kind of crop it's going to grow uh, at the place that they, they, they have it now. So the science that I do try to, tries to, in a way, offer this for these people for free. <clears throat> Give the knowledge that I have and the knowledge that I'm amassing from all the amazing data that all of you collect um, to, in order to create free models for these people to use. 
in order to maybe in the future, in your future hopefully, for a person with their phones to get to a location and say, this is the crop that you should grow here without any kind of uh, any money being spent in that uh, fashion. Um, as I said, uh, most of the data that I have to build my models comes from people like you, people who are analyzing climate, people who give me soil data. And this whole endeavor, this whole scientific endeavor, made me not only appreciate the people that I work for, the people that I'm serving with my science, but the community uh, that transits around it. And I think that um, someone said once that knowledge is power, and it is. And I th just think about the amount of power that we have here, uh, only by the people who uh, attended AGU this week, and the amount of power that we have, and the amount of power that we can use to, to turn this around. We still have some time to turn the tide, to use the power that we have, the knowledge that we have to turn this around and to serve these people uh, and offer them a better solution for their lives. Um, my science also allowed me to look at other worlds. Um, currently, I'm working on models to grow things on Mars, to, in a way, help future generations, the years from now, now even my grandkids possibly are not going to be able to enjoy this, but in a way, the data that the community is offering me and the data of the plants that I'm creating through hybridizing individuals like tomatoes and goji berries. Uh, they taste great. Um, for them to be able to grow in soils that are poor in nutrients and arid surfaces. Um, for, for us to be able to see our true potential as a race. And I think that most people don't think about that when we do our science. I think that expanding our knowledge on the potential that we have to go further and to colonize our planets and to utilize our science for the benefits of the entire humankind, I think that this should be always on your radar. And this is what I try to, to do with my science. Uh, to finish uh, and to just conclude, and I'll take a lot of time because I don't want anything buzzing at me. Um, I do believe that, as I said before, that science should be about service and every single piece of science that we do, even if you think that it's not relevant, even if you think that it's something that is just good for academia, it will have an impact on people's lives. And everything that you do, even if it is a small outreach or uh, initiative or the science that you do, it's influencing a person who is losing their farm, losing their entire history, I think it's something that you should take in consideration. Serve the people and people will treasure you. People will treasure your science. People will not defend what they don't know. So being out there, being out there in terms of putting your science and making it available for those people is essential for us to get what we want, for us to continue to make the science that we so treasure and adore. Um, so I think that just to conclude this, uh, the only message that I want to leave behind is do your science for the same uh, uh, I mean, background that I have in terms of use it for service, but at the same time try to see the niche that you um, will insert yourself in order to propel the service even further. Try to see how you can <coughs> help out other sciences with your science in order to serve. So uh, with that, that, that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you, Raphael. Yeah, it's a good reminder that being a scientist is sometimes so much more than just doing science. Next speaker is James. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks you for being here on a Friday afternoon. Uh, I'm beginning my talk with, uh, my name is Jim, and I'm a climate scientist. And you're supposed to go, hi, Jim. Hi, hi Jim. <laughs> this is interactive, folks. Um, I, I really, this is a, a fascinating opportunity um, to tell my story. Um, I've always been fascinated by the environment. Um, I grew up in East Tennessee, basically in the Smoky Mountains. Um, I grew up about eight miles from Dolly Parton. So that's uh, my only claim to fame. So I, I could actually stop right here. 
Um, but I, I, I remember, even as, as a, a teenager, swimming in some streams in East Tennessee, and um, I, my friends were all having fun, surreptitiously drinking beer when they shouldn't have been, and I was fascinated by where the water came from. And even more geeky, I was convinced that everyone else had the same thought I had. Of course, they didn't. I, I learned pretty quickly that my tribe, our tribe, is not that big. Um, and early on, uh, pursuing that passion about, about how, the, how the world works, where the water comes from, was enough. Um, it was an itch that I scratched, and I scratched furiously. Um, but I knew that there was more. Um, I knew even from the beginning that it wasn't just a passion to understand the how of the planet, but there was more to it. I just didn't, wasn't able really to articulate it either to myself or to others. So when I was a graduate student, I chose two fields to work in. This was in the 1980s. Uh, I chose paleoclimate and, and the carbon cycle. Uh, this was out of a dual desire, a desire, one, to study something that was important. Even in the 1980s, we knew very well that climate change was real and this would be an important thing to do. But also, I was also scratching another itch that I wasn't really articulating well, and that was that itch, um, as the previous speaker said, to serve society, that there was something important about studying climate change, there's something important about studying the carbon cycle. And over time, that latter reason has become more and more dominant. I have spoken in public about sustainability and climate change um, so many times now that I've, I've lost track, something on the order of once a week for about 30 or 40 years now. Um, and uh, I started out, you know, being a very, you know, scientific talk, physics, chemistry, and I noticed that, yes, I was preaching to my, my tribe, but most of the people in the room you know, it's kind of glazed over after the first 20 minutes or so. And so I started thinking, you know, how can I bring in that other piece that I know is in there that needs to be in there? And so I started to speak more and more about ethics, about morals, and I've become convinced, I think as many people have, that really the key to understanding and dealing with climate change is not physics and chemistry, we got that. It's about getting people to understand what's right and what's wrong and to do the right thing. <coughs> Um, I'll tell you a little story. About uh, 20 years ago, I started to end all of my talks with three uh, ethical things that we could do as a species that would get us closer to sustainability. And the last slide would pop up on the screen, and it says, and it still says, it's time to end male domination. And 20 years ago, that got stares. 20 years ago, people didn't like that slide. As a matter of fact, I gave a talk at Colorado School of Mines recently. They didn't like that slide. Um, but people didn't like that slide. I, obviously, it gets a very different reaction now. Now, why would I say that? And I say that, as you all know, because really population has to be controlled. And demographers tell us over and over again that the number one way in which we can control population on this planet is to empower women more economically and more politically. And when we do that, we naturally move towards not only a more equitable situation among the sexes, but we move towards uh, a more control of population. And it is really um, that piece, that, that last piece, that has become more and more um, what I talk about. Uh, I learned to reach out to other people, not just with physics and chemistry, but with talking to them about what we all share. I talk about children. I talk about grandchildren. Um, I talk about ethics. I talk about God. Um, one of the most fascinating talks I've given recently have been uh, the subject of science and God because it is really a, a fascinating topic and really it, it, it brings into focus to me when I, what I think uh, I will end up with which is that while I started out really focused on the how of the environment I now recognize that the why of the environment is just as important. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I just saw a study today that the acceptance rate of, of papers is higher if you have a diverse set of authors. So, um, so we have about 10 minutes for a conversation with our panelists. <coughs> Raphael, come back here. Oh, there you are. Good. Um, and the floor is open for you guys if you have any questions for our panelists. Um, and there's one. I 
I'm happy to talk about yeah, that. <laughs> it is it is scary. Um, Can we're repeat the question, if possible. Oh, sorry. The um, if you plan on if you want to consider leaving the field of whatever academia flavor you're in, how do you exactly do that? How do you deal with that anxiety? How do you know what to do? Is that a fair? Um, there, it's difficult, mainly because that's the environment that we know. That's the environment that our advisors and our mentors and our supporters know. So they're the ones that are guiding us, and that's their expertise. So finding people outside of that is useful, and you can do that at meetings. You can do that um, AGU in particular, but GSA also and other conferences have career-specific things where you can go and talk to people in industry and find out what skills you need and what life is like. People are really open, um, and they're looking for good skills, good talent, and you can find out um, what that's like and build your network talking to those people. Often they're willing to take on students as mentors. And so, you know, really finding your resources. I know not everyone's advisors are um, supportive of them leaving the academic environment, so if that's the case, look for other people in your department or on social media. You can find groups of people, kind of your tribe, and, and get a lot of support that way. Grow those networks that are outside of what you experience every day. It is hard, it is anxiety producing, but it's definitely something to consider. You know, some people love research and it is a wonderful thing to do, but there's lots of ways that you can use your skills outside of the academic environment. It's a good question. I would just add to that, that um, probably, I, I think more than half of my graduate students uh, have pursued careers outside of academia. Uh, I, and I think that's, that's not unusual in the field. And it's also not unusual today. I mean, there, there are many, many more opportunities for you today than there were 30 years ago. Academia is not the only pathway. Um, follow your heart. I'll take a stab at that. You know, we tend to talk about science like it's a thing, but it's actually an approach to learning about some things and learning about some processes. And so for my personal answer to your question, uh, I walked away uh, because I loved nature. It wasn't science I loved. I signed up to be a scientist because I thought that was a really efficient and value-returning way to approach understanding nature. But I stopped loving exploration when I had to be in a very uber-competitive environment to get money, to build new instruments, to go do something that had value in the field when I realized that all of that was an excuse for me to go back into the field, which is awesome. And the same thing happened with my love of the Mars exploration I was working on. So when you think about science as an approach to understanding a different thing you love, depending upon what the action is that you want to move toward and away from just the approach of science, there are a whole host of reasons and ways that you can move to action. So for example, becoming a science communication specialist. There are a lot of people in our country who are afraid of over-educated people, and in particular scientists, because we use 50 cent words that nobody else knows except our own cohort of people. And the imprimatur is upon us to learn how to use the words that are the vernacular so that people will understand what we're really talking about is nature 
and the technology that allows us to live comfortable, healthy, and productive lives. So being a good communicator is one way to move to action. When you speak about esoteric or what looks like esoteric science, to somebody who's suffering from end-stage cancer, the rings of Saturn sometimes are not very inspiring. And I personally could no longer justify spending all of my time exploring Mars. I asked myself, if you're so smart, why aren't you helping people who are miserable? And then I realized that actually I'd really rather help the people who are miserable while maintaining my interest in the planets and in this planet and in all the things that make it tick and work together and in all the things that make us tick and work together. So depending upon your personal context, your call to action may look different than my call to action. But we are all able to choose agency and act knowing that we have the choice to be productive and loving and respectful of our planet and of each other while we use science to try to understand all of these things around us. I hope that helps a little. Beautiful. Still have time for questions. Um, perhaps online there is one. Yeah, that's, that's an online question. Are there any, this is for Mr. Rafael, and uh, are there any crops that can be effectively grown in very arid earth climates? Are there, I'm sorry. Are there any crops that can be effectively grown in arid earth climates? Oh yeah, many crops can effectively grow. And we can actually learn a lot from Native Americans in this term. Uh, Native Americans have been using a tremendous amount of different crops to be able to grow their food uh, in <coughs> arid regions and use a system that could possibly be used in Mars, the three sis uh, sister system. So yes, uh, we have crops that are able to grow on extremely arid environments. And if we don't have them, we can easily try to create them, hybridizing individuals to try to come up with the answers for individuals to be able to grow in certain conditions that they wouldn't normally grow, borrowing a, a, a little characteristics from one individual to the other for us to try to build maybe a hybrid or a new individual that it's able to uh, uh, sustain that kind of environment. But yes, we naturally have those. Yeah, we have a lot to learn from science that's not traditional Western science. Probably have time for one more question. Don't be shy. It's not data. It's not figures. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's thank our panel again. <laughs> and we'll move to round two. So... Evelyn, Yushin, Delia, Kim, and Rachel, please. We have our second group of incredible researchers and um, science communicators, and we're going to start with Evelyn. Hi, everyone. My name is Evelyn Valdez Ward. My preferred pronoun she, her, hers. My love for science began when my undergraduate mentor approached me and said, do you want to go to California all expenses paid to study plant water transport research? And I remember thinking, who the hell would ever care about that? <laughs> and it turns out that that was me, that I would care. You see, I'm an undocumented Latina scientist. And in the sciences, there aren't many scientists that look like me. So I'm faced with constant obstacles and struggles in my path through academia. 
And oddly, I've learned a lot from the world of plants and soil microbes about how to be strong in the face of adversity. And as cheesy as it may be, today I'm going to share some of those messages with you. How do we switch slides? <laughs> The first message, the struggle for existence is a source of strength. Sometimes there are going to be things, or people, or president, that are going to try to bury you and keep you from reaching your true potential. But when this happens, think about plant seeds. When seeds are trying to grow, they first have to be buried and covered in the soil, and they can be alone and within complete darkness. Some seeds can grow relatively quickly, but other seeds have to wait years, maybe even decades, before they receive the right conditions in order for them to truly blossom. But when they receive these conditions, they grow. And in that same way, through your tough challenges that life may throw at you, really ground yourself and stay strong. And we can learn a lesson about grounding ourselves from plants as well. When plants are faced or trying to grow within nutrient-poor environments, they don't give up. Instead, they grow their roots, and they try to get stronger, and they try to face the environment and the challenges that the environment is facing, or the challenges that the environment is throwing at them. The second lesson is to find your allies. Plants can't grow and thrive on their own. There are limits to how much water or how much nutrients these plants can take in. And so plants will recruit, recruit soil microbial communities and soil microbes around them in order to help them. These tiny microscopic allies in the soil are the reason that plant can increase their impact that they have. And then these microbes can also help them fight against certain pathogens that can introduce disease. The associations between plants and soil microbes, amazingly, is what I'm studying right now, because these associations can also help plants stay strong against the effects of climate change. In my own work, I have seen how if soil microbial communities, if they are adapted to drought, and then you introduce a plant into those drought adapted microbes, then the plant will then become more drought tolerant. In the same way, you must find your allies. The allies that will help you obtain the resources that you need when you can't find your own. The allies that will help you fight against the pathogens that you may face in your life. The allies that have been through it and that can help you through it too. The third message, community and diversity will lead to resilience. A plant needs a diverse community in order for it to thrive because the diversity of a plant community will affect the kind of resources that it can acquire, it will affect the kind of microbial communities that it can recruit, and also the kind of resilience it will have against um, climate change. Now sometimes there can be a single type of plant that will try to come into a community and try to invade and take completely over the environment. These plants can sometimes exhaust these soils of nutrients and create toxic environments to the point where other kinds of plants won't be able to come in. But if a plant community is diverse, this community will be strong and it'll help avoid these invasive plants from coming in and completely taking over. In the same way, we must have a diverse community to surround us and to protect us in order for us to be able to do good science. Because the more diverse we are and the more we can work together and share our resources, the better able we are to uplift one another and the stronger we will be to fight against the voices that are gonna to try to silence us or tell us that we don't belong. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Um, I found it really important during my PhD program to find allies, and you might look around you in this room and find that uh, the people sitting next to you may become your allies as well. So up next we have um, Yushin. Wow, how, we, how can I top that talk? <laughs> I'm really on a lot of pressure. Uh, hello, my name is Yushin Wu. I'm coming from uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab in Berkeley, California. And uh, thank you for being here. I think this is more people than actually my science talk <laughs> in the room on Monday. And uh, I, I'm sure I was exhausted, you know, me too. I mean, like the, and 
hour of the end day uh, on a very long journey. And I, I think we heard enough about science and uh, I personally got a little, little bit of science fatigued. So I'm not gonna talk about actually the science I'm doing, I'm actually gonna talk about how I actually got into, the, into this field, uh, that kind of personal story. So when Heidi first asked me to come, whether I wanna come and give us a talk, I quickly said yes, because I thought, you know, this is gonna be easy, you know, who doesn't know why they're doing what they're doing, right? So, so, so I said yes. But, but when actually, after when I think about it more carefully, I, I think it's really not a very easy question. You know, you, you know, I think you do science for such a long time, you kind of forget how you got started. I kind of, I even went online following Heidi's suggestion to look at this guy, um, Simon um, Sinnott. So he had, he had this inspiring uh, talk called Start With Why. So I watched that talk, it's very inspiring and very uh, thought provoking, but you know, even after watching that video, I still couldn't kind of get my thoughts straight. So I thought I kind of went back and think about how I got started and maybe to find out why I actually got into this field. So um, I don't have any slides, I got this little cheat sheet here so I can remember, God, my brain is freezing after the whole week. So I, I, the title of my talk is not shown here, but I think I have my original title as how did I get become a geoscientist and a quest for why. Like this is kind of a, a strange title because normally you would actually have the why first, then the how, right? It's like writing a proposal, right? You have to lay out all the why, the motivation, then the research plan, the how. Otherwise, you're not get your project funded. So we all are pretty familiar with that. But I think, you know, life or career doesn't really, it's not like proposal writing. It doesn't kind of uh, normally plan out well at, at the front. At a young age, you know, your funding agency in, in this case, your parents don't really have the chance to, defund, to not fund you. So I kind of started kind of exploring a lot of things freely. And uh, you know, I, I grew up on a you know, farm family that my parents, neither of them had a lot of education. So I kind of, a, they didn't really have a lot of expectation for me to kind of, you know, to be, uh, to do something grand in, in, in later. So I kind of uh, spent a lot of time playing in the wild, kind of being curious about many things in nature. Um, you know, um, I, I think when, when, when I grow older, I kind of doing uh, pretty good in school. So my parents' expectations are kind of growing very high. So they're starting to expect in college for me. And I was, you know, again, I have no, uh, I didn't really think too much about my future back then. I kind of spent most, time, most, time, most, most of the time playing and, uh, and you know, but Eventually, um, I was thinking maybe I should go to college, but you know, back then, I don't know, uh, maybe some of you come from China, you know, uh, but most of you probably don't. In China, back then, they have this program called uh, College wa uh, Exam Waiver. Basically, you can actually go to college without taking the entry exams, like the SATs. So I was, you know, offered that opportunity, and I was really happy because uh, you know, I didn't, I, although I was doing well in exam, but I didn't really like them. So I basically took the opportunity to go to uh, basically the, you know, arguably the number of college in China, Peking University, and I went from there. But I, again, the, the courses they're offering are limited. They are really, this is a program designed to track top students to the not so popular kind of uh, programs like geology, physics, and math. So, so that's how I, I, I got started in, in geoscience because I, you know, that's kind of by accident. But uh, later on, I think, you know, I don't have two hours to tell the story, maybe I have maybe just one minute left. And uh, fast forward to today, I think, you know, looking back, I really felt uh, fortunate to actually choose, chosen this field. It, it really took me to many different places, explore many different topics. And I think, you know, it, it really is, um, it, I'm constantly amazed by how little we know about the, the earth, the nature that, that, that's surrounding us and how we, sh you know, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the many processes that, that seemingly simple actually are profound, profoundly complicated. And I, I think, you know, curiosity and, uh, and uh, uh, exploration are wired in our brain. I think I heard that from NASA uh, today. And I think, you know, what I'm trying to say, the take home message, I mean, there's always a take home, take home message for any talk is, Maybe you started in this field by accident, but there's no reason you can find more than 100 re you know, reasons to absolutely fall in love with this field. Thank you.
right, thanks so much. Um, it's kind of interesting because I kind of think of it as a ripple effect, how some of us, we started out with this interest in nature and it kind of um, trickles into other things and allows us to make a difference and an impact with the science that we do or the communication that we do. Up next we have Dahlia. So I was walking with my family on the beach um, in Florida when I was kind of early high school. And um, we were walking, enjoying the sunshine, and all of a sudden a storm started coming in. And the sky got darker, and then we started seeing lightning, and then we started hearing thunder. And, um, and they said, oh, we, we probably should head back. And I was like, no, guys, I got this, I got this. I know that if you see lightning, you count the seconds between when you see the lightning and when you hear the thunder, and that's how many miles away the storm is, so we're good. And they said, well, what's that relationship? And I was like, well, I, I think you multiply by three. I think, I think you divide by five. Um, and so they kind of started trotting back because they realized that maybe I had a little bit to learn. But in that context of as we were kind of sprinting back, trying to avoid this extreme thunderstorm, I realized that had I known that, it would have had real world applications to whether or not we were sprinting, walking, or jogging. And for anyone who wanted to know, it's every five seconds the storm is five, one mile away. So now I know. But that interest in extreme weather continued, and so fast forward to college. I'm sitting in a freshman seminar, and um, I'm from Minnesota, and I see this slide, which actually is um, what a, a, a class kind of a couple years above me had put together. And it shows all of these different disasters across the US. So in Minnesota, we have flooding. Um, the Mississippi River, the Red River floods every spring. It's always a surprise for some reason. Um, and we have tornado drills every year. But I was looking at the landscape of the United States going, oh my gosh, there's earthquakes, there's storms. Look at how we can understand this in an integrated way. But how can we transfer this into a knowledge that we can really understand? And so after having some excellent guidance and talking about allies and mentors, some amazing experiences along the way, I went to uh, the field of natural hazards and I ended up at NASA. And so, you know, a lot of people think about NASA as doing space research, which we do, but one of the most compelling things that I find about our Earth is really understanding all of the different satellites that have their eyes pointed down at Earth, taking the pulse of our planet, and taking all of these different types of data and putting them into this integrated system to understand how our Earth is changing. And not just that, how our Earth is changing from precipitation, from precipitable water, from soil moisture. What I did is try to figure out, well, how can we take that data, which is free and open to the public, and use it to understand disasters? And so my research focuses on landslides, where and when landslides are happening around the world. So what you see here is a model that we just came out with this year that, um, that looks at rainfall triggered landslides around the world, understanding the distribution of where we might expect potential landslide activity. And so as you cycle through the months, which we looked in the last 20 years, we start to get this big picture, global, near global perspective on what where we might experience landslides. And this is actually the first time we can do this quantitatively around the world. But then you start to see the dots. And the dots are the landslide fatalities or the landslide reports that we've been compiling for the last 10 years. And you see that the dots, the size of the dot is the number of fatalities for the landslide. It looks a lot different depending on where you are. And so the thing that motivates me about science is how can we take all of this free and open data and all of these models and use it to better understand how to shrink the dots, right? Trying to connect the dots between what we see from space to what we experience in our backyard, but not only in our backyard, in other backyards around the world where they might not have a landslide warning system in Nepal or a, a hurricane modeling system that they can effectively evacuate. So working with NASA, working, working with the disasters program and our research teams, we're really trying to not only understand the how and the why, but as many other speakers said, communicate that to the people that are gonna make the decisions to evacuate, to mitigate um, these types of hazards around the world. So thank you so much. All right, thanks so much, Dahlia, for sharing how you're making an impact in the world. Uh, next we have Kim Cobb. Thanks. 
Well, I was almost one of those purple dots in <laughs> Malaysia several years ago, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> At any rate, um, I'm here to take you on one of my field trips to the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It covers half of our planet, as you can see. In the very middle of that is my research site of 20 years, uh, Line Islands, which is an island chain that spans from the equator to six north and is heavily impacted by El Ninos, which is the, the love of my life, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk briefly about. And I think one of the important things to remember about science is that um, we are driven um, in part by a, a strong uh, draw towards the uh, aesthetics of nature and the beauty of nature as it's been echoed again and again through the comments today, but also by some vague sense of spirituality that, that, that we are uh, privy to and, and privileged to experience. And so this was my first cruise on, uh, in 1997 as a baby graduate student. Mm -hmm. And uh, just being exposed to the open ocean, of course, very few people get to experience the ocean in this way. And it's a remarkable privilege and I was truly changed forever. And as we came up upon these remote atolls in the middle of the Pacific, uh, I got to look down over the side of the boat, as many of you may have had the privilege of doing as you're, you're coming into a port or coming over a reef and you see all these dancing colors underneath this blue, blue, blue water. Um, and so uh, as a strong person who, who loves art and aesthetics, I was, I was taken. And then of course you pull into an environment like this, which is an uh, uninhabited uh, research site and, and a remote atoll in the middle of the Pacific. And you, know, you, you are permanently changed. These places are stunning and you get closer and you you see that there are unique inhabitants there <laughs> that were there long before humans, long before you, probably know a lot more about this environment, and some of those are living underwater. And so this is my research subject, uh, corals uh, growing on these remarkable reefs in the middle of nowhere relatively untouched by human societies and many of the ills that we bring with us in terms of uh, dynamite fishing and coastal runoff and agricultural practices. These are were amazing reefs that I had the privilege of diving on again and again and again. And so the closest I've ever come to religion, I'm not a religious person, is, is being at these sites and witnessing these things and remarking on how much they have to teach us if only we could understand them better. So of course, then I get out my big hydraulic drill and I drill the heck out of them. <laughs> so this is me uh, drilling a core that takes us back in time with ocean temperature extremes. This is me installing a CTD on a reef in 2014 at one of my research sites. This is the same reef in 2015 under what would be a record-breaking heat extreme associated with the massive El Nino event, the record-breaking temperatures up to 31 degrees uh, at that site. And this is the same reef uh, six months later uh, under uh, extreme temperature stress that has taken it over the brink to broad scale devastation and death and you're looking at a coral graveyard, uh, my long term research site of 20 years succumbed to heat stress two years ago. And then several months later, he was elected. I was on my research site, at my research site at the time, uh, conducting a field expedition. And to juxtapose those two in one body uh, was a very complicated task and involved a lot of tears. And so one of the things that I emerged uh, kind of thinking about is, is what is the role for science, what is the role for scientists in championing and shepherding society forward. And many of us have talked about this today as well. But this is what I found myself saying unprepared off the cuff at the Center for Science Rally in AGU a couple of years ago, um, that we have failed to give voice to our data, wholesale failed to give voice to our data. And it was insufficient to deliver those data. We had to use our voices and use our bodies to bring those data into action. And so I will just, you know, share some of these reflections with you and invite you to reflect on the role for scientists in this era of uh, crushing uh, climate extremes that are devastating communities all across the world. Um, we have a crystal ball, how are we going to use it? We need to reset the institution of science in particular and recognize that if we're going to move forward, we need everybody to come with us, okay? We need to bring everybody along, and everybody means everybody. It means the immigrants, right? It means the transgender community. It means the LGBT and, and all the minority communities and the Native American communities. It means everybody. And so how is our institution going to accomplish this? Let's reimagine what science can accomplish. Let's reimagine what an individual can accomplish as an agent of structural change. Let's think about a role for scientists that is stronger. And mostly I invite you to, on a, on a pathway with me, of resolve. So we have the crystal ball. Everybody in the room has this unique privilege of holding this crystal ball. The question is, what are you going to do with that information? 
It's a unique privilege. It's our responsibility. It's our watch. And I will end with this photo of my four children gazing out in absolute wonder, awestruck at the beauty of our planet. And I know one day they'll grow up and they'll turn to me and they'll say, many of your kids may turn to you and say the same thing. What happened? You knew. What did you do? Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. It's a really powerful message to think of us having this crystal ball and you know what, what are we going to do with that collectively to bring this science to action. Up next we have Rachel and she'll share about some of her fieldwork experiences. Uh, thank you. Um, I certainly have been inspired by um, everyone who's spoken so far um, and I um, will share just a little bit about an experience I had recently that was definitely quite inspiring um, for me as well. Sorry. Yeah, one more button. Yes. More buttons later. <laughs> um, okay. So I, um, I'm a graduate student and um, this summer I made it all of the way to the North Pole um, in pursuit of my research. Um, when I decided I wanted to be a scientist and when I started grad school, um, I had no idea I would get to do um, amazing things. I certainly didn't decide to go into science so I could take cool trips all over the world, um, but that has become an unexpected perk, um, I suppose. And um, it definitely, uh, you know, field work takes a lot of hard work and dedication, um, but in my experience, um, it has uh, definitely paid off and um, always been a, a really amazing experience. Um, yeah, so um, the summer I spent two and a half months on the Swedish icebreaker Odin. Um, it's part of an international uh, collaborative research expedition. Um, and when all of us got on the ship, um, none of us had any idea that we would make it quite all of the way to the North Pole either. Um, but throughout this experience, I did um, have the opportunity to reflect on really why um, I study the Earth. Um, and for me, it all comes down to uh, interactions. Um, I'll just show a couple anecdotes here. Um, Um, so, I'm an atmospheric chemist, um, so I, I really like studying reactions that happen um, in the atmosphere. Um, so I was doing a lot of sampling um, off the, the top of the ship this summer. Um, but in order, to, well, I think my um, research is super interesting, but in order to put it in context, I really have to rely on um, everyone else involved in the project um, who are studying the meteorology and the oceanography and the microbiology and the, the sea ice physics. Um, and I think this is really wonderful to be able to see all of these pieces come together and all these people with different expertise, um, with different pieces of the puzzle to, to really tackle these complex uh, interdisciplinary problems. Um, so uh, this is the fun part. Um, and probably why I was inspired to become a scientist is just, um, you know, the interactions of people with their environment. Um, and in the Arctic, um, we were reminded of that uh, constantly, that as humans, we were maybe a little out of our element, way out there on the sea ice. Um, the Arctic can be a pretty harsh, unforgiving environment. Um, we definitely had some animal visitors who uh, were, were um, quite fun, but uh, yeah, interested in what we were doing. Um, I like to think that they were there to make sure we were being good stewards of their environment um, and doing really sound science. Um, you know, out there, uh, the stark sea ice um, can definitely feel a little insignificant, but um, it's also reminded um, of how humans as a species can really have a very large impact on our environment. Um, so. I hope that we can all be inspired to um, make that a, a good impact, a positive impact in the future. Um, and just quickly with my last minute here, um, the, the third aspect is the 
interactions between people. Um, this expedition was really an amazing experience that brought 40 scientists together from at least 12 different countries. Um, we had an amazing crew um, on the ship and some amazing uh, scientific support from the, from the Swedish uh, Polar Research Agency. Um, and I just, I learned so much from all these people um, about science and about everyone's different background and culture. Um, and I mean, we, we all lived on a ship for 10 weeks without internet, so uh, we really learned how to actually have those face-to-face -face conversations again. Um, and it's just really the, the support and the inspiration that I get from the people I work with every day um, that have really made the science um, worthwhile. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. It's really important that we have this international collaboration to solve some of the most difficult problems the world's facing now. Uh, we, have, we have several minutes now for some questions for the panel. Does anyone have any questions, comments? <laughs> start. I have a long list. It would take me a really long time to run through that, uh, but one of the main things that I've been trying to do is remind myself that um, it's important to use our relative privilege to reach out and make sure that we are being as inclusive as possible in the production of science, in the communication of science, in the um, delivering the value of science. And so one of the ways that that has manifest for me is a, is a major mid-career shift in research, um, coming away from a sole focus on Pacific research to a focus on building capacity for climate solutions in my home state of Georgia. Not an easy place to do that. Mm -hmm. But what a valuable lesson to learn. What a training ground that we have in our respective communities for um, bringing this science to life, truly. And so I think that that's, that's one big way. But um, I started biking to work. I joined the neighborhood board. Um, you know, I am uh, engaged with 500 Women Scientists, which is a, a major um, emotional bulwark for me, and I know many of us in the room, hopefully if you aren't part, do it. Um, and so just finding new communities, frankly, and, and, and reaching out and being proactive, calling people to task. I was on Capitol Hill today. I met with five offices from Georgia. Um, so putting your body there is, I think, extremely important, and having the moral courage to re-envision a, a future for science that is, um, is community-oriented, community-driven, and community-serving. Well, I'll go next. So I think um, science isn't done in a vacuum, and science isn't done with one nation. And so I think one of the things that we've done, not just the last two years, but continue to reinforce is that our international partners are essential for conducting our science and our missions. And, and so I think that um, it's important to reinforce both domestically and internationally. So attending these meetings, the American Geophysical Union is American with 100 countries represented. So we have such a broad reach. And so making sure that everybody knows that we're continuing to have those strong international partnerships to continue advancing science at a universal level is, is critical. And I think that's been really important in our work going forward. So my journey began before he was elected when he started his political campaign and started with a very anti-immigrant agenda and I was actually doing research at, um, I won't mention the institution, but <laughs> one of the things he first said was that illegal immigrants were criminals and rapists and et cetera. And one of my colleagues was actually talking about it and was saying how we shouldn't have illegals in this country. And I looked at him and I said, you realize I'm undocumented? And he goes, well, you don't look like one. And so, 
you know, now that after he got elected for a lot of people that are undocumented and had DACA, it was just a matter of waiting when he was going to do away with DACA. And eventually he did. He ended DACA. And I ended up writing my story in Science Magazine, and I was shocked that they even accepted it. But I wanted science to stand up for immigrants and for undocumented immigrants in particular because they weren't saying anything about it. And after that happened, then um, as part of the lawsuit with the UC system and Janet Napolitano, we sued President Trump, and we said that ending DACA was unconstitutional, and then we're the reason that it was then renewed. And ever since then, I continue to share my story. And for anyone who may not be familiar with DACA, I ask you to tweet me, email me. I'm more than happy to help you out. I also want to say that DACA is not just you know, in a politic kind of issue. It's also a science issue, and we also have to stand up and protect those that are, those that are undocumented with or without DACA. Because the reality is we're in a post-DACA world, and most of the undergraduate students that are going to be coming in do not have DACA, so they don't have that protection from deportation. And already, a lot of people within our institutions don't have that protection. So I ask you to be sensitive and also to stand up and protect your undocumented immigrants around you. Yeah, uh, I'll just say very briefly. I think, uh, you know, stay focused on what you really like to do. I think don't get distracted and stay, you know, where your core is and really connect with the community that you're in and just, you know, um, just, just be strong and know what you're doing, really. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just add a little bit because a lot of wonderful things have been touched on. Um, but uh, it is definitely... Um, hard not to to feel exhausted sometimes I think um, and maybe that no matter how much you're doing um, it's not enough um, so I think it's important too to just take take a break um, it was really great actually to have no internet access um, for most of the summer <laughs> um, and then but um, when I'm back in the the real world you know just try to be engaged, um, yeah, especially on the policy realm. Um, yeah, the, the Arctic um, is, is sort of this abstract concept for a lot of people. Um, I've learned that even though it's something that's become a, a large part of my life and um, I'm very passionate about, um, well, yeah, the polar bears are, are very cute, but um, that, that might not be the most effective way to convince, um, yeah, like my family in the Midwest that, um, that the climate change is affecting them. So, um, yeah, just, just do what you can. Um, don't be discouraged. All right, we have time for another question, comment, anything um, online or... I guess then maybe I'll ask, um, what have been some of the biggest challenges you've faced and how did you overcome those? I guess it can be related to your career or, you know, anything you feel comfortable talking about. So I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, the biggest challenge that I faced was um, giving birth to premature twins when I already had a one-year-old and a three-year-old um, as a, um, as a um, you know, assistant professor. So uh, I don't know. I don't really know how I overcame that. So I don't really know why I volunteered to answer this question because uh, I think the, the memory banks were wiped clean on that one. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I will say that um, I learned after the fact that uh, and this is one of the reasons why I was able to get through the second major challenge, which was um, the, which probably the election. But um, it, is that to proactively build your community and, and build a support structure for yourself and how important that is. 
uh, I did not think that that was so important going into building a family as a scientist. And boy, was I wrong, because there's so much culture of go it alone and you know pull yourself through and steely-eyed determination. Um, that, that doesn't really get you very far when you're facing um, some of the structural barriers that exist for uh, especially um, mothers um, or parents of very small children in our, in our society, in our, in our culture of science. So that's one of the reasons I, I think it's um, so important to learn the lesson profoundly that we have in these last two years, going back to your question, which is uh, we need a much stronger network and we need to build it before it's tested profoundly because it's being tested and we're building it on the fly but um, but let's be more resilient as a community and let's learn about resilience individually as well uh, maybe one channel I can share really is, is how actually you know think about how do you transition from a postdoc from someone who's actually working with someone else to be become independent researcher I think really one thing you know our institution you know Berkeley Lab was very supportive you know we have we do large teamwork but you know, really, oh, the key thing I found really is to find ways to work with people, to really get to know people, find ways to collaborate. That's that's how you can actually overcome. I think one of the biggest challenges for for a young scientist come, you know, from a grad student postdoc to, to to become an independent researcher. Well, I'll answer a different question. Okay. Is that yeah. okay? <laughs> that's fine. No, one of the one of the um, one of the words of advice that I heard this week was make the career that you want. And I think that, that that really has helped kind of to address all of that, to address challenges. And if, you're, if you have the flexibility um, to be able to craft your profession, to craft your job in a way that works for you, works for having three young kids, <laughs> works for having a diversity of things that you do. Um, and I think that that is really sage advice and finding advocates that will support that journey with you is essential to be able to support that effort. So. Um, I think that's been really helpful to, to circumvent some of the challenges and make them opportunities. Okay. All right. I think. Well, one more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say I shared my whole talk was on this question. Yeah. <laughs> um, but because I am undocumented, and I know maybe some of you are rolling your eyes by now, but um, I do face a lot of challenges in particular to my research. So funding, most of it is federal funding, which means that if you're not a citizen or permanent resident, you don't have access to a lot of most research is funded by NSF. And so I have faced the challenge of trying to get into the science world from the very beginning. Like I mentioned my advisor asking me to do research, but then after he found out I was undocumented, he had to find very creative ways to pay me in order for me to be able to get access to the research as an undergrad. And then when I was applying to graduate programs, then it became an issue, how am I gonna fund myself? How am I gonna fund my research work? And that has been incredibly difficult to figure out. I still haven't figured out an answer. If anybody knows anything or wants to give any money to me for my <laughs> research, let me know. But <laughs> those are one of the main obstacles. But what I have found is that just asking people and um, like that we have have said like find your advocates find the allies around you that are going to help you and that's the only way I feel like I have been able to make it this far I'm now a third year in my PhD program and I don't like I feel like if I didn't have the community or the allies around me that I built up I would not have made it this far all right thank you all so much for sharing <laughs> We're going to have one more group of outstanding scientists and communicators. Thanks everyone for being here. So I will try to share with you part of my um, 
research work and actually research work through my own story. Um, I'm from Algeria, and one of the things I'm most fascinated by are trees. So, trees, very fascinating organism. There are three trillions of them on the planet Earth, and whether, you know, regardless of the environments where they exist, they have been an integral part of our uh, human history. Whether they struggle, as shown in this uh, photograph, this is an atlas cedar existing in the slender corridor of North Africa, bordered by the Sahara deserts. Whether they thrive, like the iconic redwoods in the western, uh, this photograph is from California. Whether they struggle or they thrive, they contain unique stories. And one of the things I'm most interested or excited about is trying to unravel and extract the stories that trees have. Each tree is unique. Each tree, just like a diary, every year will record the different environmental condition through which um, they experienced. As a paleoclimate scientist, I extract the stories. You can see me here sampling bristol cone pine in the Sangre Mountains in New Mexico. Or for, after that process, after trying to collect the element of the story, is trying to extract the story by using geochemistry. So I titled my talk, Tales from Tree Rings. And tree rings can tell you so many fascinating stories. For example, the width of this ring, of this ring shown in this photograph, let us know that in 2015, the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada was the, the lowest in the last 500 years. From the tree rings, we also know in 1816, when the Mount Tambora volcano erupted, it was a year without summer. Going back in time, several decades, several hundred years, thousand years, we can give a context for our current experience with changing environmental condition. I do further than looking just at the width of the tree rings. You can look at the cells. These cells constitute one ring, and each wall around the cell has an information that tell us how trees actually responded to moisture, whether in the atmosphere or whether in the soil. One of the biggest services that trees are rendering to humanity is they are absorbing about 30% of the CO2 emissions. They are giving us a discount on our CO2 emissions. In the future, will they continue to absorb those emissions? This is a question that I'm trying to answer by studying the carbon and oxygen that is recorded in the cell walls and figure out if they're going to still render the service to us or not. So, you can see, I mean, this photograph is, is pretty um, devastating. This is the Sierra Nevada and the number of trees actually that died following the extreme drought condition experienced in the state of California uh, for several years. If this kind of landscape will be the future, not only will it change our human experience, but it also will change our, the capacity of our ecosystem to thrive in the future. Thank you. So I've wanted to be a space scientist ever since I can remember. <coughs> Every, even before I knew what the word astronomer was, I knew I wanted to study space. Um, but the reason that I study space now is very different from the reason that I used to study space. In order to understand that, I need to explain why I used to wake up every morning and why I wake up every morning now. So I grew up in a very conservative, fundamental Christian family. Uh, every day of my life was de devoted to service to God. The purpose of my life was to realize the kingdom of God on earth, to convert other people to Jesus, and to serve, devote your life to service uh, to the Bible. And um, I've always been interested in science, as I said, but the science was a vehicle for achieving that goal of, of fulfilling God's purpose on earth. And that lasted for probably at least the first 20 to 25 years of my life. Um, I continued studying science 
all the way through uh, middle school, high school. By the time I got to college, I was still very much a Christian, um, but I was starting to notice that the literal fundamentalist interpretation that I was taught and that my family adhered to, it didn't add up to everything that I was experiencing in the world and learning. Now, this is not a, a talk about my deconversion story, and I don't think that I lost my faith. I think I outgrew my faith. Um, but for a while, the reason I studied science was certainly because it was a way to serve this grand purpose that, that God had put in us. Um, now, I do think that for many scientists, there's an analogy here where there's some grand purpose, some grand question, some big thing that you're really interested in. And that might drive you. That might, that might be what you wake up every morning passionate about, that you need to work on this important problem. And I think that's a completely valid way to live your life. And I think if that's what motivates your science, then please keep doing that. But that's not what happened to me. As I got further through college and into graduate school, and I became more of a liberal Christ Christian and somewhat of an agnostic and now an atheist, I didn't replace that faith in God, that uh, singular purpose in life, with an anal analogous science problem. Instead, I found a very different way to appreciate life. And it's not at all based around my science, although it's led me to, to really appreciate my science and make it a very integral part of my life. So today, when I wake up in the morning, it's not because there's an important grand question I need to answer. It's not because I'm trying to bring about the kingdom of God on earth. But in a very simple level, I start, I, I, I start to stir in the morning, and my cat jumps up on the bed. And what am I confronted with? Here's what I've learned. I'm confronted with the boundary between myself and my environment. When I'm sleeping there, I don't know, I'm just me. I'm just subsumed in my whole environment. There's nothing that separates me from the world. My cat jumps up on the bed. I am forced to confront that there's an environment out there. It's different from me. There's an object interacting with me. I, there's, there's a me and there's a not me. And that is philosophically profound in a simple way. Uh, I, go, I go from my bed, I go to make some tea. And this tea, it comes from Taiwan. So I'm sitting here in Delaware in my office drinking oolong tea from Taiwan. I'm confronted with the fact that my environment extends far beyond my immediate surroundings and in fact encompasses the whole globe as a planet. Now those are very simple examples, of course. But the point is, what I'm seeking after is not a singular purpose or singular solution, but personal and societal transformation. And so what I have come to learn is that one way that we can strive for transformation is to seek after experiences that confront us with the boundary between our environment and ourselves. And so there's a couple problems that I'm really excited about in science that I think can do this, uh, both for ourselves on a personal level and on a societal level. Um, I study exoplanets. I'm really interested in planetary habitability. And um, you know, I think about well, where's our planetary boundaries? We live in countries. We, 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 we have a technological civilization. There's city lights going out into space. There's radio waves. The, the boundary of our planet is greater than the physical limit of, of our exosphere or, or even the solar system. There are, there are parts of our solar system that are going beyond. So where does our boundary end? Could we look for signs of life elsewhere? Would we see techno signatures of other civilizations that tell us that our boundary does not extend through the whole universe, but in fact there is an other somewhere that we might find? I'm also really inspired by this idea that we might send humans to Mars someday. I think this is an incredibly transformative event that could potentially reshape the way we think about our societies. Uh, but you know, these transformative events can happen on small or large scales. So that's really why I study science, and that's my challenge to you. Seek transformative experiences. Seek to challenge that boundary between your environment and yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Yeah, science is more than just exploring our area of expertise. It's really exploring ourselves as well. Um, is that right? Yes. So I originally titled my talk because I wasn't really sure what, how to do this talk. So it's all about how I study snow. Um, but I think it has a lot of bearing on, oh, oops. on kind of what has shaped me to be the scientist that I am. 
So I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up on the shores of Lake Michigan. I was born in Chicago. I grew up in a small town north of Chicago. My mother thought that was way too urban, so we spent a lot of time where she grew up, also in the shores of Lake Michigan in southwest Michigan, um, because we, she wanted us to be by nature. So I lived in a place with abundance of water, tons of um, extreme weather, and a lot of nature. I probably should have known then that I would be an earth scientist. However, I didn't know that. Um, where I grew up in the Midwest, if you were good at math, if you were good at science, you should become, you should go into business, and you should go to a good college and go into business. So that's what I did. <laughs> Actually, I studied mathematics in college. I took some more science classes, and I had a great mentor um, in George Philander at Princeton University, but I didn't become a scientist. I went to Wall Street, I worked at Goldman Sachs, and I was an investment banker. <laughs> That's me in that little pink, um, in the pink circle, in the sea, also similar to science, sea of men, sea, sea of white men. And I, I probably, I, I was there, and I was still really interested in science and math, but I was learning all about financial risks. I was covering insurance companies, I was covering reinsurance companies, I was covering exchanges, and I was learning about financial risks, um, in one of the best places to do it. And I started covering um, structured products related to reinsurance companies and insurance companies. And lo and behold, it was catastrophe risk. It was risk of hurricanes. It was risk of extreme precipitation events. It was risk related to climate change and questions about climate change, even emerging almost 20 years ago. Um, and so from there, I started questioning some of what we were doing. And I would say, you know, what does science say about the risks? I don't think we're assuming the risks properly. And I would be told, you don't have a PhD, you know, stop talking, stop asking questions. And so I said, okay, I'll go get a PhD. So that's what I did. <laughs> and so at first I started with my PhD thinking, I'm gonna get my PhD and it'll be great and I'll go back and I'll work in reinsurance, I'll be a risk officer, risk, um, or like a chief investment officer, like I'll get it, I'll understand climate, I'll understand weather, I'll understand the risks, I'll be great. But um, me, someone from the Midwest, from somewhere where there's abundant water and no mountains, started studying mountain snowpack and changes to mountain snowpack and how mountain snowpack was melting earlier than um, before in California since 1930 and how um, this change was actually all across the Western US. So I got really interested in questions of water, particularly in mountainous regions. So this Midwestern girl was really interested suddenly in mountain snowpack and mountain water. And when I finished my PhD, I had a number of offers to go back into finance. But I thought, I'll do a postdoc, and I'll do it on uh, global climate modeling, because this global climate modeling thing seems to be really important, and it's the future of understanding global climate, and that has more implications for financial risks. Um, and so, you know, I still thought when I was doing my postdoc, I thought I was doing finance. So there's a lot of people here that are scientists and are like passionately knew they'd be scientists. I still didn't know when I was starting a postdoc. So I started my postdoc. I did some research on high mountain Asia, climate variability and change, because that interested me for water security issues and national security issues. So I started exploring and understanding risks in Asia. And then um, I also, coming back to the Western US, instead of just studying climate change and climate variability, I also got really into seasonal prediction is it possible that we could have crystal balls of what the future holds for climate on multi-month or multi-seasonal timescales? Um, and it does. I had this paper come out um, in the winter about snowpack predicting it nine months in advance. And now I'm also seeing seasonal prediction as a way for climate adaptation. So if we have extreme years and we have extremes that we, that we know even further out, if we know the months or seasons out, we can actually do something about that and we can plan for it. So I started being interested in climate, I started being interested in mountain snow, and now thinking, you know what, there's a lot of other problems to society that we can also have that with my financial background um, now drives my research. So another project I've done was understanding climate change of mild weather days. So days that happen pretty regularly, there are days when you wanna go outside and go play soccer, um, go to a ball game, and these days are also affected by climate change. So we often think about climate change as something that is the extremes, but it's also affecting the number of nice days that we have. So I've evolved 
over time in my thinking about science um, and why I wanted to be a scientist. And I can firmly say that I'm not going back into finance, and I love what I do. Um, and I love answering questions about all aspects of science related to water and to society. It's really trying to help us. Thank you. So we have a couple changes for the last two speakers on our schedule. A couple um, people committed to do the talks and had um, different family situations come up, travel situations come up, that they needed to, um, to either not come to AGU or, or leave early from AGU. Uh, so where is the best place at AGU to find two um, speakers for five minute talks about why we do science? Mm -hmm diversity, equity, and inclusion workshops. So, <laughs> you're in for a real treat as Rebecca and Terry share their story about why they want to experience, or why they want to be scientists, why they are scientists, um, and I'm really excited to have them join us. So, Rebecca. So I went a little old school and wrote my speech on paper. So um, my name is Rebecca Marchesi, and I'm currently a senior at Northwood High School in Silver Spring, Maryland. And I'm also an intern at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And um, although I'm only 17, I know that a word that I love so much and I think describes a lot of who I am is passionate. And that's because I love coding. I know I can sit a whole day coding and not feel a single hour pass by. Um, I love to engineer things and take things apart and put things together, like computers and radios. And sometimes I can get a little out of hand with what I take apart. Um, and I love math. I remember taking calculus in high school, and I was like, why do people not like this class? <laughs> um, and today I'm here to say that I chose to devote my life to STEM because I know that I can see the effects from climate change right now. And I know if I don't do something about it, my kids are gonna see even the worst effects. And renewable energy, hopefully, is going to be normalized once my generation goes into the workforce. And so I know I wanna be part of the growing influence that it has um, in our lives. And I love space exploration. And the technology we send up there can answer a lot of questions we have about our own planet. Um, and I've been passionate about STEM for a couple years, and I know I'm only 17, so a couple years is like, it's kind of unthinkable, but recently I came upon an epiphany about why it's imperative that I study STEM and I study what I want to do and what I love. Um, and it's because I can be a leader for others, an example for other women and other Latinos that want to study STEM. And um, doing all of the internships and all the jobs that I've done so far, I love what I do and like my experiences that I have, but one thing that kind of stays in the back of my mind is the lack of Latinos in the STEM community. And although I love the STEM community with all my heart, it's definitely something that I want to help expand. Um, and I wanna have the chance to support other women who want to learn how to code and might not have the opportunity or they just don't have the structure to begin learning how to code. And I remember a couple weeks ago, um, this girl from my school, she, just joined the wrestling team, which I've been a part of for two years now, and um, she told me that I was her inspiration for joining the team. And when she said that, that, that word hit me like a truck, because I don't think of myself as inspirational, like I'm just like little me, like in school and like doing what I can, and I'm very early in my career. Um, so when I think of inspirational, I think of like Michelle Obama. And it was a big shock to me to hear that. And I soon realized that you don't have to have like a big name or be famous or have everyone know who you are so you can do little changes in your community. And um, that's why I'm so adamant about my love for STEM is because if I'm out there and people know that I like to code and I'm in STEM and I'm gonna pursue that, then hopefully I can have other women who are in the same position as me follow their dreams as well and not be discouraged about the representation in the STEM community. And I'm just so lucky to be able to pursue what I love and be that person who can encourage others to follow their dreams as well. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful rest of your AGU. That is why I do what I do. <laughs> okay, and our final speaker for this session is Terry. Hi. 
Um, my name is Tara Emke. I'm a fourth year student at UC Berkeley, and I study environmental fluid mechanics. Um, yesterday, when Heidi posed the question to the group, um, who, does anybody here want to talk about like why you do science and what got you into it? I approached her and I was really um, unsure about talking because I was saying, you know, I don't know what the big picture is that I want to study and as a fourth year I'm starting to think about what, what I want to do afterwards. Do I want to go into academia? Do I want to leave academia? And a lot of those, um, both of those questions come with like what is the global problem that you want to solve? And Heidi said, don't worry, you don't have to solve, you don't have to come up with your global problem like overnight. Just, just talk about what got you into, into this field and what got you started. And so when I was in, or in undergrad and I had to start writing my, um, my letters for, for grad school, I had to really think about like, why am I going into this field? Like I really want to study fluid mechanics and I really want to study this water and why do I want to get a PhD? And so the very first thing that came to mind was that I want the PhD because I want to be autonomous in research. If I decide to do research later, I don't want to have to come up with a, come up with a question and then have somebody else say like, okay, great, we'll now find a PI because you can't be the person who gets the funding. I was like, no, I definitely want to be in charge of whatever I do. I don't know what it's going to be, but I want to have the option to be in charge. So that's the first reason why I am deciding to pursue graduate school. And the second reason why I chose environmental fluid mechanics was because I've always been involved in water. Um, I grew up in Michigan, so also from the Midwest, but I grew up in the middle of the state. So not close to any of the lakes, but um, both of my parents were swimmers and I spent a lot of time in the pool. And in high school, my parents got me into water polo, so I spent a lot of time um, just tussling around and kind of feeling the different, the different flows that happen in the pool. And if you push the water one way, then you go the other way, and why does that happen? And so that's really where my curiosity grew from. I said, okay, well, I spend you know, 10 hours a week or so in the pool, but I don't understand anything that's going on. Like, I know how to get myself to move, but why am I moving that way? And so those were really the questions that got me started um, to thinking about grad school and the next level of things. And so really right now, I'm in the middle of that. I have a 600 gallon tank of water that I get to play with every day. Um, when I'm stuck instead of in the lab and I don't want to write the paper or code, I just go and I sit and I said, okay, let me watch and what happens qualitatively, right? Like maybe if I can figure out what's going on qualitatively, it'll kind of give me inspiration for um, what this, this equation means or what I have to write next. And so I'm, I'm here, I'm in grad school, I'm, I'm playing with water every day, and I mean, I just really enjoy it. And then when I go to water polo practice now and there's an undergrad who's like, oh, something, something, whatever is happening. And I'm like, actually, well, you see that vortex there. Let me tell you why this is here. <laughs> and so it's really, really fun to say, like, four years ago, I didn't know that. And now I'm on a path to where I, when I do things every day, I can explain why they're happening. Thank you. I told you all you were in for a treat. So we have uh, five, ten minutes again for some open questions. Um, open questions from online, um, people who are watching online, open questions from in here. Do we have anyone who wants to start with the first question? Um, so, I know for me, the reason why I decided to go into STEM in the first place is because of like, just a computer science class in the summer of 2016 at the University of Maryland while I was doing a residential program. And um, just after I wrote Hello World in Python, like, I knew, like, this is for me. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I remember I would tell 
all my friends what I learned because I just, I, I don't know why, I just love it so much. And I think it's so interesting and I love telling other people about it. So I think having the exposure yourself or giving other people the opportunity to get that exposure will lead them into a path even if they don't go, eventually go down that path. They know what they like and what they don't like now. I can add something to that. Um, I've, I've recently come in, learned about some research that, that looks at, you know, how do you do effective outreach? And um, there was a, a talk earlier in the session about, you know, <coughs> we don't have a data problem. Shouting data at, at, at people is not actually going to change minds. And, and some of this research I've, I've in, uncovered is that maybe inspiring curiosity is a better way than teaching people information. And so I think what you just said is exactly that. And I think any way that you can, that we can inspire that curiosity, even for people who are diametrically opposed to things we might think, people who are mistrustful of science, if you can get them to, figure, to, to actually genuinely be curious about something, I think then the rest of it just follows naturally. I think that going off of that point, um, showing somebody that what they're already curious about can be taken in to the scientific method or the scientific fashion. So if you have somebody who says, oh, I like this, and I like it because of this, and then you say, okay, well, you know, you decided that you liked this because you tried all these other things, and you, and this one reason is the one that, the reason that you like it best, so therefore you already um, did what a lot of scientists do by, you know, sampling different things and figuring out what's important to you and going after that. And so I think if you reframe um, a lot of a lot of things that people are already thinking or that they're already saying into a way that models what they associate with science, then they'll see the connections. Well, I will add, I guess, two things. Uh, the first is, you know, it's simply sharing your story. Um, we're privileged at the University of Arizona in my department is the tree ring lab. You know, wood is very organic, and when you have people come and visit, whether there are um, school students or you know different different I would say category of population you just share your own story and then you just show them you show them what you do you know we show people rings we let them count them and they get inspired first to to realize that you know you may look at a tree and not think what else you can you know extract from a tree as an information but also that you know we're just people who happen to be curious about particular questions so yeah and Last piece. Um, for me, it was mentorship. The yeah. mentorship that I got early on, I didn't know I was going to be a scientist, but that, that seed was planted that I could be a scientist. Mm. And so as time went on, I realized even though I had gone to, in all my classes, I never had a female leader. So I didn't also think of women as scientists. Mm -hmm. It was very ingrained into me. And so it wasn't until I got older that I was like, wait, I, I like to ask questions. I'm creative. I should be a scientist, and I love this. So I think for me, having that great mentorship that I've had all through my career has had a major impact on me. And so I um, actively, all of you, please mentor the next generation and make mm -hmm. sure that you find people, people that also aren't like you, yeah. to mentor them, to make them come up through the ranks because then they'll reach out and reach out more people. Yeah. And I think that's the way that we get people involved. Thank you all. Do we have a next question? If not, I'll jump in with one. So I've done a bunch of programs on leadership training where there's an emphasis and a focus on values and, and kind of exploring ourselves and thinking about if we were to put one or two or three values or 10 values forward um, out of 200, out of 500, out of thousands of values that we could put forward, what is it that we would put forward to the world is, is sort of some of the core values we put forward. If you could name and describe one value that's important to you and why and how it makes the connection you whole. Sure, I can start, but I'm curious to hear what everyone else has to say. Um, mine would be free inquiry. I think free inquiry is the basis of not only science, but I would say of, of even dare I say our constitution, but I think that free inquiry is, is a, a lifeline. If, you're, if you are caught in a delusion, if you're caught in bad thinking, if, if you're caught in any sort of intellectual prison, uh, if you have genuinely free inquiry, you can get out of it. And I think that's on a personal level and on a societal level. So I think that's an important value to defend. Um, I can go. 
One thing I really value and try to share with others is just education, whether it's academic or cultural or just any kind of help information that can get out to others. And so that's why I also love the pre-college program that I'm in because they kind of take in these students from underrepresented groups who know nothing about going to college or how to apply or what it is because their parents haven't done that and so they have no background or foundation to get up in life. And so I think it's important to share just the little things. If you know a piece of information or someone who, who, someone who else who knows that information, I think just leading others to that is very important. One thing that I really value is loyalty. And I mean, I guess it's a little bit different than the previous two values. And it doesn't have to be loyalty to a different person. It could be loyalty to yourself. And just saying this is, you know, if you if you have that list of values, just staying true to them. And so, you know, there are definitely times when I make promises to myself and I'm saying, like, okay, today I am going to go home and like read a book after school and somebody else says, oh, do you want to go out? I'm like, no, because I made this promise to myself. Like, I have to be loyal to myself to um, pursue what I believe in, do what I think um, needs to be done and stay true to that and not let that cha be changed. Well, the most important value for me is the sense of community and collaboration. Um, some of the problems we face in our society, or whether they are scientific questions, require diverse perspective to maybe grasp an answer. So, collaboration. Um, so for mine, it's sincerity. So um, being very sincere in my mentorship, in my working with others, and then also why I do what I do. And I think that, um, in that way, our voices come out and are very compelling and are very much, um, people understand where we're coming from and are thinking about it. Thank you, everyone. Um, so our, I guess, panel, you can stay up here since you're our last panel. Um, so concluding remarks, uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. Uh, if we do this next year, I'm going to try and, like, you know, s sneak in a keg or something <laughs> so we can all have some beer while we're doing this. Um, so I guess uh, one of the things that we all got from today's three panels, uh, beautiful, diverse minds, all with uh, different paths and still on the same planet, is that community um, is key. Um, it has been key since science started almost 100 years ago as an AGU entity, um, and it's going to be key now more than ever as we go forward fighting to preserve our funding, um, to preserve our lines of science, and to be able to speak um, when we're not allowed to. Uh, for example, a few hours ago I went to a session uh, presentation where the speaker uh, presentation was being given, but he wasn't there. Um, the speaker is an international speaker, and he wasn't able to get a visa to come and uh, present his work. Um, that's one of those little um, microaggressions that we are starting to see permeate in the sciences, especially of international scientists. Um, and uh, as the community that's here, um, we have a lot more voice and power than we think we do to support um, each other and to ensure that that doesn't happen. Because it's, there's nothing sadder than seeing like your work having been done for years uh, be presented and you not being able to like give your heart into how you presented it and what you found interesting and have your advisor have to do it for you and have him have to say, oh, can you please email him? I'm not actually sure what, what, the, what uh, his methods were or anything like that. So, you know, just for the, for the sake of preserving that like scientific curiosity that we uh, all have and helping others continue it, let's, um, Let's uh, try and strengthen the bonds between each of us at all of our institutions and places of work. And um, I actually encourage you all that in this next year of our um, centennial celebration that you reach out. Um, say hello to someone that you don't know, maybe in a coffee shop. Uh, start a conversation about uh, why a vortex happens in the swimming pool. I think that's pretty cool. I used to wonder about tsunamis when I was five. So. You know, like someone would come up to me and then like tell me about it, and um, 
you, you become more and more curious, and that's how you start. Um, as uh, in high school, uh, thank you for being here, and um, I hope that you can, you can let your uh, friends and peers know about AGU. I certainly didn't know about it as a Latina in high school, um, so you're, I really applaud you for being here. Um, so I also want to give a, a big thanks to the rest, to our fellow conveners, Tashiana, um, Heidi, who got two other wonderful speakers to come, Sanjoy, who's hiding in the back <laughs> here. Um, and I just want to say uh, thank you all for coming to AGU. Thank you for coming to this talk on this Friday. I hope that you get a happy hour somewhere um, if you're going to one. And uh, yeah, let's, t let's uh, take a deep breath for a bit before we have to start thinking about 2019 AGU, which is now everywhere in this building. So uh, have a good one, guys, and thanks for, thanks for coming. <laughs>